When I travel down south, people say, well, brother, you don't know what it's like down here. We got a lot of Catholics. When I go up north, the people say, you don't know what it's like up here. We got a lot of Catholics. And I live in the Midwest, and you don't know what it's like here. We got a lot of Catholics. They're everywhere, people. One billion of them or more on planet Earth. And uh, what you're dealing with are people who, to whom the Bible is a closed book. And uh, what little they've heard from the Bible, they've already chosen not to pay much attention to because they've been told that they really can't understand it. And they are people that are in a system that is a system of religious works. I've read the Council and Canons uh, and Decrees of the Council of Trent and uh, highly recommend it to you. Here it says in page 53, dealing with the Canons on Baptism, if anyone says that baptism is optional, that is, not necessary for salvation, let him be anathema. Now, anathema is fancy language for saying, curse of God. When uh, you pulled in front of somebody on the highway and they, God damned you, uh, that is what anathema is about, damned of God. And uh, if anyone says that one baptized cannot, even if he wishes, lose grace, However much he may sin, unless he is unwilling to believe, let him be anathema. So here you have conversion by water baptism and the ability to lose that conversion, which of course wasn't real conversion anyhow. If anyone says that those baptized are by baptism, made debtors only to the flesh alone, but not to the observance of the whole law, let him be anathema. So then you have a system of trying to keep the commandments and trying to keep 613 points of the law. What if you don't keep the points of the law? Well, then you need to confess your sins and have your sins expiated by saying a certain number of Hail Marys or some other penance that you would pay. Penance. It's not a song of sixpence, meaning a, a part of currency, but the idea of being penitent and demonstrating that you're contrite by doing something. And uh, Lent is a concept of penance and, and giving up something to, to afflict the flesh. You see people in third world countries, uh, bare skinned, who will take a whip and whip themselves and bring blood and they're doing penance. So you will see people crawl uh, in Guadalupe, I've seen this, where they crawl uh, on their knees and, and they'll wear right through the skin on their knees and leave trails of blood spots as they go to a statue to kiss its feet. It's a system of self-righteous works. Now one of the hard things about Catholicism is that the Catholic believes that his church, her church, is the only true and accurate church, having started with the Apostle Peter and that the Lord Jesus Christ gave Peter the instrumentality of uh, being the head of the church, and they think that all of the popes have followed in uh, Peter's uh, footsteps. I have here the Catholic Encyclopedia. Uh, you can get encyclopedias of Catholicism and read the material. I would recommend at some point in your life you get one of their catechisms, which is a system of questions and answers. They ask the question, how is the soul saved? They tell you about salvation, converted baptism, and maintained by the lifestyle. Uh, the sacrament of baptism is declared as it constitutes a sacramental bond of unity linking all who have been reborn by means of baptism. So baptismal regeneration is taught by Catholicism, hence the baby, when it is baptized, has forgiveness. And the original sin of Adam, expiated by water baptism. Then when they come to an age of accountability, an age of responsibility, then they are going through their catechetical training, catechism, when they have their first communion, and this is true, by the way, not just in Catholic churches, but in Lutheran, Episcopal, and many others. Then they take personal responsibility for their sins. And when they sin, they have to go to the priest and confess their sin and do a proper payment. What you're looking at is a total denial 
of the efficacy of Calvary's cross. A total denial of salvation by grace through faith. The church recognizes, I'm reading from page 65 of the Catholic Encyclopedia, three forms of giving valid baptism. Immersion, aspersion, and uh, infusion. So, sprinkle, pour, or immerse. The Roman rite is the method of infusion, and uh, meanwhile, the church recognizes as valid baptisms properly performed those baptisms in agreement with Roman Catholic dogma. And so there is an extent to which the Roman Catholic will say, well, we're really alike, except we've got more right than you do since we're the one true church, but you're just a separated brother. Do you understand that the Roman Catholic thinks that you will be converted to Catholicism while you're in purgatory, and that you will emerge from purgatory into heaven, having been converted to Roman Catholicism by purgatory. Do you realize that there is, and this is the name of a book by Wilder, The Other Side of Rome, and that this business of the Mass, and this business of indulgences, this business of relics and uh, rather superstitious worship of objects and crying statues and all of that kind of stuff, have all been used as a measure of Roman Catholic belief. That means something. That means that since you don't have those things, since you don't have the Virgin of Guadalupe, since Jesus Christ is not appearing to you, they had in New Mexico a restaurant that became a tourist haven because when the cook sliced a tomato and the tomato parted, there was the Virgin Mary in the slice of tomato. And so they kept the slice of tomato and people, oh, Jesus. In Cincinnati, in the courthouse, in one of the marble columns, they say Jesus is there. There was an oil spill on the side of one of these big tanks that sits on the ground. And that oil spill in the shape of Jesus. And they thought, wow. And cars were blocking I-75 to look at the oil spill. You're looking at religious superstition. I have the catechism of the Catholic Church. I've invested a fair amount of time going through the catechism of the Catholic Church. In the back there are indexes so that you can look up subjects and be stunned that the subject you're looking up isn't there. I turn to the catechism of the Catholic Church and I am looking for the word salvation. I find salvation comes from God alone. Sounds pretty good so far. And I turn to salvation coming from God alone, and I find out that it is the work of the Holy Trinity that is placed to our account, starting with water baptism. What I'm getting at by exposing you to these books, which are easily accessible to you, is that you have no idea how far from the Bible Rome is. You have no concept about how unbiblical Roman Catholicism is. You have been taught to be egalitarian, you have been taught to be ecumenical, you have joined with Roman Catholics in social issues, you vote with them, you protest abortion with them, you ought to be telling them how to be saved. Now there are verses that you can use to refute Romanism, and I want to give them to you. In Matthew chapter 16, here is a section of scripture by which you can refute that Peter was the first pope. They say Peter was a pope. Well, in Matthew chapter 16, Simon Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And Jesus answered and said unto Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, Petros, that's, that is rock. And so they say, well, Peter's the rock. And so uh, upon this rock, they think it means the man Peter and not the words that he said, I will build my church. They think that's the church that's in existence today, not knowing that that is the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Kingdom Church and that you are in an entirely different church, the body of Christ church. Peter gets the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Peter is the one that they think the church is built upon the testimony and the doctrine and the man, Peter, and they have Peter as the first pope. Well, in that exact section of scripture, in the Roman Catholic Bible, Peter tries to prevent Jesus Christ from taking Calvary's cross. And Jesus says to Peter in verse 23 of Matthew chapter 16, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. That would seem to be a death knell for Peter's papacy right there. And your Catholic does not know the content of his Bible. I can assure you he does not know the content of Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, and that it is about Peter, and that Peter is said to be an offense, Peter is likened to being Satan. Notice then in Hebrews chapter 3. And in Hebrews chapter 3, in verse 3, a man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, that's Jesus. Verse 4, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Then the church isn't founded upon Peter. Any church has to be built upon God. And that's the function of that verse. In a Hebrew epistle, I understand where we are. We're trying to deal with the issues being God and not Peter. And the Romanist, he worships Holy Mother Church and believes that salvation is only there. Well, we've already seen Peter a devil instead of being a pope. And we've already seen that the builder is God and not Peter or men. I want you to notice also in 1 Peter in chapter 2. In uh, Catholics love when you take them to 1 Peter because they venerate Peter as the first pope. And in 1 Peter in chapter 2, in verse 5, Pete says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, I know that you're not the holy priesthood, and you know that. And I know that Peter is a, a minister to the circumcision. I know that First Peter is not about the body of Christ. What I'm after here in First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, is that Peter talks about a spiritual sacrifice. Peter's not talking about a literal blood offering. That's important to your Roman Catholics. I want you to see in Luke chapter 2 that Mary was a sinner. In Luke chapter 2, when the days of her purification... Why would there be days of purification in Luke chapter 2 if Luke is a New Testament book? Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on the other side of Calvary's cross are Old Testament books because there can't be a New Testament until after the death of the testator. You know that from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 and 17. Mary, when the days of her purification were in place, according to the law of Moses were accomplished, then Mary did that which was required by the book of Leviticus. In, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 23, parenthetically, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opened the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord, 
and to offer sacrifices according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. When you were born, did your mama take a pair of true turtle doves and, and wring their little necks at church? When you were born, were two young pigeons sacrificed? Well, then don't tell me that you're following the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ because you're not. But beyond that, notice, Mary had two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, offered. What does that mean? Well, Leviticus chapter 5, verse 7 says, And if he be not able to bring a lamb, he shall bring for his trespass, which he hath committed. Mary was poor. Two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, Leviticus chapter 5, verse 7, unto the Lord. One for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering. Guess what that means Mary was? That means Mary was a sinner. Mary needed a Savior. And that means, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there is but one God and one mediator between man and God, that the man, Christ Jesus. So what I'm trying to do here is to give you verses to refute some of the major issues of Romanism. And again, as I have tried to school you all during this series dealing with evangelism, deal with these issues quickly and get back to the gospel of the grace of God because that's the important issue. They need to know that Jesus did everything necessary for their soul salvation. You have an advantage with a Catholic because they've been taught they're sinners. You have an advantage with a Catholic because they know about Jesus, they know he died on the cross, they know about the death, burial, and the resurrection, they, they have some belief about the Bible. It's not foreign country to them, but grace is a new country to them. Grace and that Jesus is the just and the justifier is something they know nothing about. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus condemns tradition. In Mark chapter 7, in verse 6, he answered and he said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honoreth me with their lips, and the heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, and laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men. And so tradition is something vilified by the Lord Jesus Christ. Roman Catholic people have been victimized. And the way in which they have been victimized is... They've been told that the Bible is one of three authorities. And so when you've got an authority, the Bible, you have an authority, Holy Mother Church and her dogmas and doctrines, and you have an authority of tradition. What must you then do? You must arbitrate over these authorities, hence you have a pope and cardinals, and the final authority then becomes human wisdom based on tradition, the activities of the church, and any resemblance between Roman Catholicism and Bible-believing Christianity is purely coincidental. And the fact that they use a lot of the same words really doesn't mean much, because they have redefined so many of the terms. You know something about all people. You know Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Catholic people are as ignorant of the word of God as anybody you're ever going to run across. That being the case, if they don't know the Bible, can they be people of faith? If faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and you are a Bible believer, so you know that. If faith and the word of God, if the Bible engenders faith, then it's obvious that the Roman Catholics have something they call faith, but it turns out to be mystical superstition. It turns out to be the veneration of objects. It turns out to be oriented toward the sliced tomato, the potato chip that has Mother Teresa's visage on it. There was a perfect resemblance of the Lord Jesus Christ in the cement under the urinal in a men's room. 
I'm not making this up. And people would go. I shouldn't have said that. People would visit there just to see this on the floor. Mysticism. The one true church that has identified itself as the repository of all truths turns out to be the devil's own denomination. Turns out to be a source of error. And people have been victimized by it. People have been victimized by a system that is religious, mysticism, and superstition. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Catholics being foreigners to the Bible are then not in a position to be people of faith. Catholics are born. They're not made. They're born into a Catholic home. They're born in a Catholic country. They're born in a Catholic tradition. Hence, it's not about doctrine. The assumption is they're right. And you say, well, I go to the Lutheran Church. Well, you're a Protestant. You left us when we were wrong, but since the Council of Trent, we're right again. You should come back. And along comes Robert Schuller and says, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't go back. Along comes ecumenicism and I don't see any reason why we couldn't uh, co-join with Roman Catholicism, so says Charles Coulson in his efforts to have evangelicals and Catholics come together, and he wins a Nobel, Peace, or a Nobel Prize for that, a Templeton Award for that. You know better. You know that you have here people that have been victimized and are trusting their water baptism and a system of works and it's vague and it's confusing and the one thing that they know for sure is that they're right and you're wrong but they couldn't define why they're right and they couldn't define why you're wrong they just know they are it's visceral it's traditional it's ingrained in them the only thing you can do is show them in God's word information that that might get them to address the issues of salvation. Now, I'll tell you something. When you take a Roman Catholic to the Bible, the Roman Catholic may put up with you doing that. And he may actually look at the verses and be stunned at what they say. But the Roman Catholic has been taught all his life that nobody can really understand the Bible except the higher-ups in the church. So he's going to come away from what you show him. He's still going to be doubting. He's still going to be working on the assumption that you're wrong. And that he's right, although he can't identify why you're wrong or why he's right. I like to show them Acts chapter 10. Because in Acts chapter 10, I've got an Italian guy. That sounds Roman. And he was a certain man of Ce in Caesarea uh, called Cornelius a centurion of the band called the Italian band. So I've got myself an Italian leader here. And in verse 2, he's devout. Don't Catholics call themselves devout? Well, I'm not devout. Well, I am devout. Who knows what that means? One goes to Mass and one doesn't. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house and gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Look at that guy. Why, that would make you a deacon in a Roman Catholic church. You're devout, you give money, your whole house goes. Peter says of Cornelius, you have no part. Peter declares this devout, prayerful, giving, devoted man with his family as having no part. Peter declares this religious fellow without hope. That is useful in presenting that it's not works. You can be a devout Italian and still be wrong. When I've done that with a Roman Catholic, when I've taken them to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, and showed them that it is a gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. Do you know what? He'll go home and read that in his Bible and have a note. And at the bottom of the page in his Bible, it will say, Salvation is a gift of God, not by works, but there are sacraments of grace. 
and then he'll be given works, and they'll just change the word to sacraments. So you've got something here that is circular reasoning. You have rather a catch-22 situation where the Roman Catholics are so alienated from Bible truth that it is very difficult to communicate Bible truth to them. And they've been told not to trust that you can interpret it properly. What do you do then with Roman Catholic people? How do you deal with them? Because in many ways, they're almost the same as the skeptics that we just dealt with in the previous hour. They don't know anything for certain. They just take it from another authority. Well, the skeptic, he gets it from his own brain or from his own concepts. The Roman Catholic, he, he puts his brain in the Vatican, but he takes it from him. It really doesn't matter greatly. And I hope you've understood this as we've gone down through this series identifying the different demographic groups. There are things that you can say and things that you can do that are appropriate to each demographic group, but eventually the essence of the issue is the cross of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection as payment for sins. And eventually that is where you have to get because that is the center of everything. The problem with Romanism is they believe the Lord Jesus Christ did most of what is necessary for a soul to be saved. The Catholic has to finish the deal. I've talked to more than one that said, well, Christ did his part, now we have to do our part. The issue then is an insufficient Savior. You might take them to Matthew chapter 27 when Jesus said it is finished and point that out to them that Christ said it was finished and there wasn't more to do. In every instance, there are tactics you can use. There are ingratiating remarks that you can make. There are avenues of entry into a conversation. And you are always wise to recognize your audience. I'm not going to talk to a Catholic about Mormon issues. I'm not going to talk to a Mormon about Catholic issues. But neither am I going to allow myself the luxury, the, the error, of getting off track by either Catholic or Mormon issues, I'm going to focus in on, and I'm, I'm going to have blinders like that racehorse headed for the cross. And that is where I need to get, and when I get there, I need to deliver the goods. So do you. We're talking about evangelizing, and I'm standing in front of a camera. I don't know who you are. But my best guess is you have never led a soul to Christ. My best guess is you have never given out the gospel and watched as a person profess faith in Christ and seen and witnessed a soul's conversion. My best guess is you are exactly the person that I need to be talking to. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about you, so forgive me. Maybe you are engaged in evangelism all the time, forgive me. But my best guess is that's not the case. You may have a story to tell, but that was five years ago. Well, what's the difference between you and the person sitting next to you? You're not doing it either. We need to be delivering the goods. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. May I point out to you, Christ didn't send you to win arguments, but to preach the gospel. Christ didn't send you out to make everybody a right divider. He sent you out to preach the gospel. Nobody has rightly divided his way into heaven yet. If you go to heaven, it'll be because you heard the gospel and that you trusted the gospel. The preaching of the cross is to them which perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. Now I need to wrap this up so we can move on to some other course material. You are established as a believer and you are saved by the gospel of the grace of God which is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. God saved your soul as a product of the gospel of the grace of God. Romans 1.16, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. 
Nobody else is going to get saved any other way. Everybody else is going to get saved the same way you did, by grace through faith, by trusting the finished work of a risen Savior. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 about the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. The preaching of the cross. Churches don't want to do anything foolish today, so they're not much preaching the cross. Churches want to appeal to the unsaved and not offend the unsaved, and so what ought to be a gospel message degenerates into asking Jesus into your heart, making him Lord of your life, come down front because Jesus never bothers with the people in the back of the auditorium. The Lord only bothers with people that come down front. And Christianity has become a terrible place to go to get saved. The, the, the church today has become an awful place to hear the gospel of the grace of God and to be saved. Today's preaching, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, is about the opposite of foolishness. Why, you go to church today and you see a Madison Avenue slick, polished operation. The unsaved people, they don't think it was foolish. They think, wow, that was pretty neat, great entertainment, good singing, oh, production values are outstanding. I've asked hundreds of people, when I would go to work on Monday, 20 years in the Christian bookstore business, I've asked scores, hundreds of people, how was church yesterday? And their answer would be, it was beautiful. Whoever told you it was supposed to be beautiful? Where did you get that idea? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and that's the issue. Churches don't want to be foolish today. People care about their reputation. People want to have a reputation uh, uh, that was prideful. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Why, nobody wants to admit that the power of God unto salvation is the cross. They want to brag on their denomination and their missionaries and their or soul winning efforts. Folks, if anybody is saved, it's because of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. I've not come here to give you methods. I've not come here to give you approaches and play the tricks of hiding the little bitty Bible in your pocket that nobody can read. I, I, I've purposefully avoided that because I'm interested in you talking to people as, as real people and you dealing with the realities of their situation and you, the reason I've talked about demographics is identifying the grouping that they're in so that you can then diagnose their problem and treat it with Bible verses and see souls saved. My interest is not in programs. My interest is not in politics and polemics. My interest is in the preaching of the gospel. Now, you don't have to stand in a pulpit to preach. When you tell people how to be saved in the grocery store, they'll say, well, quit your preaching. And so it's not a matter of a position. It's not a matter of a place. It's not a matter of a person. It's just what you do as you are the minister of the ambassadorship message. People will tell you they believe in God. Well, the devil believes in God and trembles, James 2.19. People will say they believe in Jesus. Well, the devils believe in Jesus, Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. People will tell you their stories, they will identify their situations, they'll tell you they're hopeless, they'll tell you they're helpless, they'll tell you they're a skeptic, they'll tell you they're Roman Catholic, they'll tell you all kinds of things. You have one message. And what you intend to do by identifying the people with whom you are, are speaking is to help them get to their understanding of that message. You need to get an opening. You need to get them on track. You need to do that in a way where they are thinking. When you take that opening, when you take that opportunity, you give them the one thing that is in all of the Bible, the one thing that will save their soul. The Gospel of Christ. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. Verse 3, how that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. You go to the gospel of the grace of God and make certain that no matter with whom you're speaking, that that is the end game. That is where you're going. So, let me turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You identify your audience, and we've done a lot of work in that regard, seeing their blinded minds, seeing their alien from God, seeing they're without hope. You identify the audience. You identify what that audience is likely to say, and we've done that. Men wrote the Bible, maybe there isn't a God. Well, I think you have to live it. We've identified the kinds of things that they might say. We've identified how to deal with them according to their understanding, their demographic group, to deal with that quickly and then to move on. And when you move on, you are, you are a person in a particular situation right at that instant. You are a person right then, capable of doing something that I can't do, that no one else can do. You are the person that is in the right place at the right time to deliver the goods, to deliver the gospel of the grace of God. God doesn't have anybody else there. He's got you there. You've talked about whatever it was and channeled the conversation around toward the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there you are. Now would not be the time to go numb from the neck up. Now would not be the time to learn how to be evasive. Now would be the right time to be direct. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul says, I'm ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also the women, and he goes on and on. You don't do this with a, a bunch of fear and trepidation. You don't do this as if this is the only time in your life that this is ever going to happen. You do this as a workman. And you press on for the mark. You get to the issues. People talk about crunch questions. People talk about methods. And people talk about the kinds of tricks that you can play to deliver some information to somebody. I'm not interested in any of that. And I would encourage you not to be either. I would encourage you to get right to the gospel of the grace of God. When you stand before God and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? What are you going to say? That's a pretty good way to approach it. Because when they give you their response, you can help them and tell them what the right response is. When you're dealing with a person, deal with them as they are. Another member of the human race, same as you, and you used to be as lost as they are. You used to be as without hope and helpless as they are. You're not looking for crunch questions. You're looking for faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Avoid giving them opportunities to reject the gospel of the grace of God. And this is my last point. Avoid having your conversation with the unsaved being confrontational and combative. The way you're going to do that is to look at your Apostle Paul and learn from him. When Paul is talking about other people, he will say, even as I. Paul puts himself in the same boat. It's not, I'm better than you. It's not, I'm condescending to you. It's, we have the same issue, you and me. You're saved. The person you're talking to is lost. And so, wouldn't it be better to say to the unsaved person, let me show you what I found out. I didn't know this. Look at what I learned. Can I 
just show you what I didn't know. You don't know it. I didn't know it either. Let me show you what. Join them. Doesn't Misery Love Company? Join them. And encourage them that you're not condescending, you're not looking down your nose at them, that you have a heart toward them, that you care. When you testify as to how your soul is saved and show them that their soul can be saved, they found out that you care about them. They found out that you have a heart toward them. Isn't that a good thing? And so in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, in verse 7 he says, whereunto I'm ordained a preacher. He started with prayer. He started with prayer for people that had the opportunity to preach the gospel. He ends up, he ends up giving them the gospel. You don't think you're ordained. But the works of the body of Christ have been ordained. And when you are saved, you become part of the body of Christ. And Ephesians 2.10 tells me that then there's works are something that you are to engage. You have the ministry of reconciliation. You are the one who knows his Bible. You are the one who can deliver the goods. When you are engaged in the presentation of the gospel, do it with clarity. Understand what saved you that you understood you were the sinner and you trusted Christ's payment for your sins. For you see, there's a tendency to avoid talking about sin. There's a tendency to talk, avoid talking about the blood of Christ shed for sins. There's a tendency to try to, to cover over these hurtful and hard issues. You don't have to hide from them. Just share them with the person that, hey, I share the same condition, I, I, I have the same problems, and it's by God's goodness and grace that my soul is saved. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. So you got a bunch of liars and the priests are running things based on the lies. And my people love to have it so. Oh, church was beautiful. Lying prophets, priests doing the wrong thing. We had great services today. You should have seen the children getting the eggs and we had the Easter Bunny show up in Sunday school. And the cantata, oh, they sang and all the angels were flapping their wings. The prophets prophesy falsely, the priests bear rule by their means, and the people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Well, that's a good question. What will you do? What will you do to make a difference for the cause of Christ? What will you do that souls will be saved and the saints will be edified? We spent quite a bit of time here dealing with evangelism. We spent quite a bit of time here dealing with the issues associated with evangelism and the clarity of the gospel of the grace of God and the identification of the different demographic groups that you need to focus in on in order to be able to deliver the goods of the gospel of the grace of God so that it is received by the hearing audience. We've invested a, a considerable amount of time in that. Well, the purpose for all of that is that you now do something with what you've learned. That you now get engaged in presenting the gospel and that you now see souls saved. If I'm right and you've never seen a soul saved personally, you've never personally given out the gospel and seen a soul saved, if I'm right and that's you, let this be one of my last opportunities to say that about you. 
lets you get engaged in doing the work that God would have you to do. Now, I've been a good boy. I promised you I wouldn't bog down in a lot of personal anecdotes, and I promised you that this would be about evangelism, and I wouldn't degenerate into storytelling. I've been a good boy up till now. I want to wrap up this series on evangelism by taking you to Leviticus. And back here in this Old Testament book of Moses under the law, I read in verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, he shall bring your offering of the cattle, even the herd of the flock. And if his offering be burnt sacrifice, let him offer a male without blemish. And gives all of this instruction. And uh, the people have done wrongly. And the people are uh, inappropriately doing things. And so then, back here in this story in Leviticus, the people have gone to church, the people, uh, for them it was the tabernacle, and the people have done what hey, they were instructed to do, but it was all wrong. And as an illustration of Israel's error, uh, Leviticus chapter 1 is a very good example. Well, today, you can go to a fundamental evangelical, Bible-believing, missionary-supporting assembly of King James whatever believers. And all wrong things happen. If we just have all eyes closed and no one looking around, if you'd like to go to heaven, raise a hand. If you'd like to go to heaven, raise a foot. If you'd like to go to heaven, raise your other foot. Come down front and ask Jesus into your heart. Open your little heart's door. I talked with you some about this three hours ago. There's a real problem getting souls saved today because they're not hearing the gospel. They're being inoculated against truth because of all the wrong gospel presentations that they're hearing. They're being inoculated against the gospel of the grace of God because they've heard something they thought was the gospel, but it wasn't. They've done something that they thought was salvation, but there was no reconciliation there. You've got people who think they're Christians and aren't. You're surrounded by them probably right now where you are. There's somebody that thinks that he asked Jesus into his heart and made him Lord of his life, and that's how he got saved. There's somebody that thinks that they prayed the sinner's prayer, and that's how they got saved. Church today is a pretty bad place to go if you want to get saved. Because there's a lot of preachers that don't know how to get you saved. There's a lot of preachers that don't respect the Word of God enough to trust the Gospel of Christ to be the power of God unto salvation, and so they have hearkened after a gentleman named Charles Grattison Finney. Finney was into revival theology and revivalism, and it was Finney who back in the uh, late 1800s invented the so-called invitation system, come down front, every head bowed and every eye closed, and all of that business. It was about crowd manipulation. It wasn't about salvation. In Luke chapter 1, in verse 67, here I've got Zacharias, filled with the Holy Ghost, prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, and from the hands of them that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant. You got people who think that they have joined the church and now they are a partaker of the Holy Covenant, that they are going to be saved from their enemies, and now life's going to be good because they're in church. 
You've got people who think that 1 John 1, 9 is the plan of salvation. They confess their sins and God's faithful and just to forgive them on the merits of their having confessed them. They're not saved. That's not the gospel of the grace of God. That corresponds to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40. You can confess your sins until you're out of breath. You can turn from your sins until you screw yourself six feet into the ground. You can ask Jesus into your heart, make him Lord of your life, put him on the throne of your heart, open your heart's door, and all of that machinations of just rhetoric and miss heaven and go to hell. You're saved by grace. God's grace is offered you at Christ's expense, Christ having died for you on Calvary's cross, your faith in his payment for your sins, his propitiatory sacrifice, your faith, God then counts for righteousness and accords you salvation on the merits of what Jesus did. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 says he forgives you for Christ's sake. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not live after sin. You find out some things in your King James Bible. You learn the clarity of the gospel of the grace of God and you teach it plainly. Back there in Leviticus, in chapter 1, in verse 10, you have some people who are sorry. You're going to have people that repent at every service you attend. In Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 10, if his offering be of the flocks, namely the sheep or the goats of the burnt sacrifice, and you shall kill it by the side of the altar, and Aaron's son sprinkle the blood on the altar, and shall cut it and do all of this kind of stuff with it. What they're doing is is inappropriate. God hasn't given them those exact instructions. Those, those are error prone. And yet they're faithful to do it. I'm going to go back to Ephesians chapter 2 now. And in verse 11, in Ephesians chapter 2, you've got your apostle Paul in verse 11 telling you that, remember that Ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The body of your sins is destroyed by the blood of Christ. Your old man is crucified by the blood of Christ. You, Romans 3.25, have a propitiatory sacrifice through faith in his blood. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. It's a bloody gospel. Ephesians 1 7 speaks of his blood. Colossians 1 14 speaks of his blood. Ephesians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 speaks of his death, burial, and resurrection. And it was, it was an awful event. But he endured that for the joy that was set before him. And we don't preach his endurance. We preach the joy. We preach the gospel of the grace of God. We preach the good news of Calvary's cross. And we need to get that plain. We need to get that right. We need to make that clear. Reconciliation for every soul on planet Earth was accomplished by God in Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, 19 tell you that. That being the case, your job is to present the word of reconciliation. We're not interested in embellishments. We're not interested in methods. We're not interested in how clever we are. 
were interested in delivering the simple, plain words of the gospel of the grace of God. And let the word of God work effectually in them that believe faith having come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Don't make presenting the gospel a hundred times harder than it is because then you'll quit. Don't make it an epiphany. Don't make it a once in a lifetime experience. Don't make it something that it isn't. Let it be what it is and let it be plain, let it be ordinary, let it be honest, let it be you in agreement with the person that needs to be saved that you needed to be saved also and look what you learned and show them how that Jesus is the just and the justifier having provided for a soul salvation. No one goes to hell because they're bad. All the sin that comes short of the glory of God, there's nothing special about that. At the end of the day, you'll go to hell because you didn't believe the gospel of the grace of God. You didn't trust Christ as payment for your sins. You didn't understand that reconciliation is in Christ. When you land in hell, that will be why. So the, the activities of church sometimes get in the way. The methodology associated with evangelism sometimes is more trouble than it's worth. Certainly, telling each other anecdotes and stories doesn't get us anywhere. You have people that love to repent. You have people that love to feel guilty. You have people that love to confess. You have people that love to go to church. You have people that love to go down front. You have people that like to make a spectacle of themselves. You have people that aren't happy unless they're unhappy. You have people that just cry at the drop of a hat. You have people that are all the time tore up. You have people living soap opera lives. You get caught up in that and, and you're not going to help them. God is not interested in human good, God obviously hates human evil. God, in His righteousness, has one standard, one plan of salvation, one method by which a soul is saved. It is the gospel of the grace of God, and I know you know that. Do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in heaven? Do you believe that unsaved people are going to be in torment for all eternity? That being the case, why aren't you motivated? Are you the pillar and ground of the truth? Do you know what the gospel of the grace of God is? That being the case, why aren't you motivated? Do you understand that as a member of the body of Christ, it's your job? That Paul says he beseeches you by Christ's stead to do this. Do you realize that you are the only ambassador, there's nobody else to take your place, and that in certain situations you're the best God's got right here to get out the gospel? Why aren't you motivated? If right now, finger came down from heaven and pointed at you. And a booming voice from the third heaven spoke to you. Would that motivate you? Well, that's a shame. That's an absolute shame. The word of God ought to be sufficient to motivate you. The word of God that tells you that we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you. You want to look at the finger that came down from heaven and pointed at you? That's it right there. You are the ambassador. We've been studying it now for hours. Now you know how. Now you know the issues. Now you know the audience. 